please mute mics. Welcome, Welcome to the Martin Siegel Theater Center here at, here at the Graduate Center. Center. And to Prelude 21, uh, Start Making Sense. Um, it is our annual um, theater and performance festival celebrating the work of New York theater artists and ensembles. And it's hard enough in normal times to create work for the stage and for uh, spaces inside and outside. But in the time of Corona, we all are faced with exceptional challenges. And uh, we are here to celebrate again the extraordinary achievements that come out of the New York theater community. It is time, I think, and we feel, to start making sense to ask uh, questions. Why are we making theater? But also, how are we producing it? And for whom? And uh, this is a great investigation again into the um, mechanics uh, of making art uh, in New York City. And we also invited uh, theater ensembles from around the US, from Detroit and Cincinnati, St. Louis, and uh, Philadelphia, uh, New Orleans, um, to join us. And um, this will be an extraordinary look into. Uh, what is on the minds of artists right now. We also have uh, many panel discussions. Uh, we have uh, an award which we're giving out uh, to honor uh, uh, outstanding members of the New York theater community. So I would like to all of you to uh, join in and uh, get an insight of what uh, is happening. Welcome, um, everybody, here to uh, Siegel Talk, and welcome to the very, very, very beginning of Prelude. I'm terribly nervous. It's a big deal for us that we were able to um, get it done. Many thanks to Andy and Tanvi. Without them, really, we wouldn't have been possible to do it, but also all our 13 curators and all the artists that participated. My name is Frank uh, Henschko at the Siegel Theater Center. So we're here in Midtown Manhattan, and um, we are starting today with the Siegel Talk, where we will do so every day. Um, in um, the week to bring artists and curators together so we get a better feeling of who they are, why they do the work, and, um, and to really um, listen to them. We um, would at this moment also like to acknowledge the Lenape people upon whose land we are gathered today, or the, even in the airwaves, and we pay respect to the Lenape people and ancestors past, present, and uh, future. So welcome, everybody. How, how are you guys? Fantastic. Happy Monday, everyone. <laughs> well, here we go. It's the very beginning. Maybe um, I'll just go clockwise. You say a very short uh, sentence, a little bit of who you are. David. Uh, sure. I'm David Bruin. I'm one of the curators of Prelude this year. I kicked off this chain a little bit, and I um, selected Daisy to work with as an artist. And I just want to say a quick shout out to Niall Harris, uh, who's one of the other curators in this chain. I just think Niall is one of the most interesting artists working today. Prelude alum, and uh, it's just awesome to connect with everyone here. So, thank you. Yeah, no, I couldn't do it. Malcolm. Yeah. <laughs> 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 about you, what you do. Huh? As a curator, who you are and what you do. Oh, cool. I was a part of the chain because of now Harris also. Um, he picked me as a curator, and um, I picked Arian as an artist. Okay. Fantastic. And uh, Daisy. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I really like this room. By the way, I'm happy to see you all. Happy to be here. I'm Daisy Press. I am a musician based here in New York City. Um, I have uh, I, I uh, perform experimental music here and in Europe and also perform a lot of the music of Hildegard of Bingen on several platforms in the world and in the ether. So more on that later. Happy to see you all. Fantastic. Thank you. A Arian. Hi, everyone. My name is Arian Wilkerson. I am the artistic director and founder of Tamal Astro, which is a uh, performance art and installation company. We make experimental, radical, punk, sexy, queer, hybrid, weed loving, like fucking fantasizational work. And um, I'm super excited to be an artist and curator. It's my first prelude ever. And I curated the lovely and incomparable, even if I'm saying that wrong, they're amazing, Damani Pompeii. 
<laughs> Fantastic. And um, and Damani. Hey, y'all. Um, my name is Damani. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist, movement foundation, movement focus, um, movement at survival, um, and also creating like really uh, visually aesthetic um, and important work for self and for others. And that's just where I'm at right now. So. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And um, maybe um, say also a little bit about you. Maybe you start off and after your introduction, tell a little bit about um, your mm -hmm. work, why you chose to do this and why you think it's important. We, of course, feel that. and But also from, to hear from you a little bit about your work. Oh, I didn't know I was going to start off, but um, my name is Aang and I'm a dancer. I just do a lot of things, but I always think of them as dance. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm making really <laughs> for this for this thing. I now reach out to me and we just talk a bunch of times and I got inspired and I was like, let's go to Statue of Liberty. And that's what we went and... We just bowed to her for hours on end, and there's some people there filming it, and yeah, that that's pretty much it. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing these days. Um, I'm glad how, I did something. <laughs> how are they feeling in this in this time? How is it? How does it feel in this moment to create work? It feels difficult for sure. Um, I think the pandemic is also catching up on me. I've been sick this past like few months. Um, Yeah, so that's why my room is pretty messy, as you can see. Um, you know, 18 months later, of course, your body has to react. At least my body is reacting. I don't know about everybody, but... Um, and then New York City has been pretty fast this past few months, too, which, I don't know, it just feels altogether very difficult, even though I'm supposedly making. But I, I don't know, I feel like I've been on pause but just pumping some things out for the world <laughs> at the same time. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Daisy, tell us a little bit about you. How how are you doing? And a bit about the Hildegard von Bingen, which we, of course, know in Germany, and uh, but they're not, she's not so well known in Brooklyn. <laughs> exactly. I, I just want to, um, to comment on what I just shared about... Um, It's so important to be honest about the twists and turns and the ups and downs of this time and how it just is hard, how it's just hard. And, and then the, there's a new level of hard that happens and another level of hard that happens. And, and so I think um, it's just so good to hear that I'm not the only person who's been going through that. It's not just me. Um, so thank you. Uh, anyway, yeah, so... Hildy, as I call her, um, she's my buddy, Hildegard von Bingen. She, I'll just, you know, to tell you all, she was uh, a, an amazing polymath who lived 800 years ago, and she was a composer, and she was in charge of a huge uh, convent, and she had these visions, and she did these paintings, and she wrote an opera, and what else did she do? Oh, she was an herbalist, and she grew things in her garden possibly weed somebody said maybe she was growing a little weed in her garden we don't know there could be an opera about that i think mm -hmm. uh but <laughs> so you know she um she came into my life in 2015 i'd already been an experimental singer here and in europe and um i just came to a place where i really wanted to sing music that felt good to my body i was like you know what this is going to be about pleasure Uh, from now on, I really want to connect to the body and her music came into my life. And then um, I started singing her music in unlikely places like House of Yes in Brooklyn and like in nightlife, in settings that were in settings that maybe, you know, not so sacred, maybe more towards the profane, but the sacred really seemed to work there. There was a musical that we made at House of Yes um, about the drug ketamine and all of its uses and, and dangers and fascinations in the world. And I would come in and sing a Hildegard chant to like bring everybody out of the, the K-hole, so to speak, that was created with the, the theater presentation. So, um, so discovering uh, the power of this music in places that like not up at the cloisters, although I wouldn't, you know, I, I of course would sing up at the cloisters, but it was like not at the cloisters. So um, 
I got to sing a lot of Hildy at Burning Man a couple years ago. Um, I right. Uh, I have had the honor of singing Hildegard at um, the bedside of people who are very ill, and uh, God. And and so during the pandemic. I was like, okay, what do I have to give? Okay, I have music to give. I can bring people into the experience of singing. So I started offering offering Hildegard sessions three times a week on Zoom, totally free for for an entire year. And uh, that became something known as voice cult, where um, Hildegard's not necessarily the main deity. One's own voice is the main deity, but bringing people through these chants in a digestible way. And... uh, and getting people to sing this music, even if they had no musical experience. Like, okay, yeah, we're gonna learn this Latin. We're gonna sing through these chants over and over and over and over. Um, So it's Voice Cult is still online. Um, It's been an honor to connect with so many people in different ways with Hildy's music. And I was just in Italy and I got to sing Hildy in a monastery that's a more kind of normal, way to sing her music so that was a beautiful trip Fantastic. and yeah, yeah. thank so we'll- you thank you really that that is quite something though instead of reopening the musical that you had written five years ago you created something very special in that time of corona that had also something to do with it and created Malcolm, tell us a bit about you as artist and curator at prelude uh, you might be off uh, on your sound <laughs> Is that good? Hey. Hi there. Um, where do I start? Yeah, um, I guess, yeah, I'm an artist and I make my own work. Um, but like, I feel like the pandemic has opened up this space of like, um, yeah, you can show up in the comfort of your own home. But also I remember doing like the beginning of the pandemic of being like in this flight mode. And um, I guess like you putting that energy into other things like, I guess like making clothes and um, yeah, just other practices that was kind of like sustaining me. Um, so I guess I think I'm thinking of, um, yeah, I guess like if the pandemic didn't happen, I wouldn't arrive to those practices and things. Um, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, but yeah, I guess I curated Arian because um, I guess like how he uses like queerness, especially like black queerness. And I hope I'm not like assuming, but I think of like um, queerness as a place of like possibility and how it like pushes against this normative. Um, So like the collages of um, just queerness and black queerness and um, reclaiming space. Um, I guess when I think of black queerness also, I think of all of the ancestors we lost during to like HIV and AIDS and like a longing for like a mentor. And I kind of see like Arian's work in this dimension of like an archive that can be like passed on to like a future um, black queer young. Um, Yeah, it's like, I guess there's so many levels. It's like always like pushing the envelope and pushing for something more as opposed of, um, yeah, just settling in like a comfortable place. Um, so I'm gonna say that's why I like I curated Arian, and yeah, I think he's also like amazing. Oh, they is also amazing and beautiful, and I'm glad that he curated. They curated Damani, and yeah, Ans here is amazing. Yeah, what is yeah. people? Yeah, Arian, you want to? You you they want sure, to? Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm just gonna like put it all out there. So like. Malcolm, Damani, and I have known each other since we were like 15, you know, so we were like 15, like, you know, so we've like, you know, and we met at this really problematic summer camp and um, um, like, and so like, it was just like what it was. It was just like a really just like problematic place, but we, but we met, you know, and, and the people that we all met too, we still love to like, to this day, you know, like 2008, 2009 is a particular time, right? Because Instagram and Facebook didn't have as much political power as it as it as it did back then now like now that it does now which is fine but we were actually you know black queers a part of the internet era from the 2000s to now if you if you look about how 2008 that, that's not even 10 years in to the world of the internet you know with google starting around 2002 you know what i mean so like if we're looking at the internet from um from like a mass standpoint we're like 
truly like internet children of the corn, you know what I mean? And so like, uh, and so like yeah, um, I had a big respect for Malcolm and I had a big respect for um, Damani because at both spectrums there were, this were super beautiful technique that comes from Damani and then really experimental, defined, clean, like airy, beautiful shit from Malcolm, you know what I mean? And then the body comes and, and then hits harder with just like eleganza and like things that are just really elegant. I just can't describe Damani's work without saying that it's like, um, it's like viscerally elegant. And that's something that is hard to do as an artist and, 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 and as a black queer artist and for Malcolm um, to, be, to be viscerally here with you, to sort of take you into the afterlife or to take you into life is like the things that I was really interested in um, and why um, I felt like we, we, we sort of all um, uh, rooted in each other's life. It's funny because, you know, my, my, my video has an age restriction because a lot of my work is very, um, uh, a lot of my work is very out there and I, um, I do use my body as a subject. I am HIV positive. So, you know, I just always looked at myself as a part of an archive, you know, like now I'm a number, a part of a system with millions of people who have died from AIDS and HIV, and I'm a part of that archive. So let me just start adding to the archive. <laughs> it was just very like, it was very simple too, you know, it was just like, let me just keep adding to, you know, who are Black young artists at the age of 30 who have HIV and still suck dick and still feel proud enough to put their ass in a thong on and like, you know, and, and to and to parade, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I think my work is, is interesting because I always battled with, with the line of technique versus versus postmodernism, you know what I mean? Just to be, just, 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 just keep it real, like just the idea of like um, form versus the, versus the ability to maintain form, you know what I mean? So like, it's it's all those things that are wrapped up in one, and a lot of my work also influences sculpture. And throughout COVID, it it was different for me because I was in Philadelphia. I fell in love with this guy. We were protesting. We were looting, robbing grocery stores, all you know, like you know, like the whole nine yards. You know what you I mean? Like throwing shit at city hall, throwing shit at police. The film that I made was called The Cis Uprising that was funded by University of Pennsylvania. And it was about queer and intergenerational legacies of fight, you know? And just looking at it from that perspective, it is still online. Unfortunately, fortunately, me and that man broke up. <laughs> so it's all, it's all, it's it's always living. It's all tea, all shade, always, you know? So yeah, yeah that's passive. I'm, I'm, I'm passing, I'm talking too much. Yeah. But, yeah. Thank you, David. Maybe we come to you after this, um, Damani, maybe you, can react? Um, you know, I feel really safe here and I'm so appreciative and honored to like share my work. I mean, you know, I made this thing, like I kind of killed two birds with one stone. Like I've been putting off this project for some time because I was just like unsure about it. And I was like, no, actually I'm just gonna go in and do it. And I have the vision, I have some resources and I'm just gonna do it. and. I'm very happy with how it came out. <laughs> um, and I'm very proud of myself. And this is the first time I can like say that out loud. Um, and this has been just like a really rough time for me and I'm coming out of it. And I'm just like so thankful that um, people still will continue to see me for me. I quit my, my job that I've been working at for eight years who I've, you know, I've grown through with and now I've outgrown and um and it's you know all love but like you know like to just keep moving forward for the greater good um and also understanding that like us sitting here is like still such a privilege and um like being responsible about that in the art we make you know like and like how we connect with everybody we encounter you know just to like be good to people like it, it like costs 0 99 no, no, I mean, oh, sorry, zero dollars completely. <laughs> be good to other people, you know? And if if the conversation gets thick or weird, like, let's take it there. Let's make art about it, you know? But don't run away from it. 
and like and also like if you're not prepared for it, that it's not no wedding tissue but yours <laughs> like and that's it you know so yeah um i'm so grateful i'm happy to meet y'all all digitally and i'm in a very vulnerable space right now but i feel more empowered than i ever have in my life and more supported and more loved and it's very very clear the pandemic has like really gifted us um what we need versus what we want and um that is so important mm. that's what I about that. movement is important be careful how you move people are looking at you you know that's it <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank you thank you to mommy david um You've been a prelude curator. I think the last time you also did it in person live at the Graduate Center at CUNY um, and where we could people bring in. Still, it's close to the outside public. We couldn't do it. We did it again the second year. Um, uh, last year also you curated it. Well, how do you see, how do you feel? Tell us about your choice, but also a bit, where do you see the theater performance at the moment? Um, well, first, it's just really great to share space with everybody. And I feel like... Um, I'm, I'm a little bit interrupting the flow here, but I'll, I'll say a little bit yeah. and tie it back into what people are saying. I mean, the live in-person experience is awesome. I mean, it's great to be there in the room and I'm really, you know, I hope all of us meet someday, but even then it's, it's great to, to connect with everyone in a certain kind of way. I guess I got, I have two things that people have talked about. I mean, on, on the one hand, I'm Malcolm invoked this idea of a tradition and I'm really invested in that. I mean, during the pandemic, I finished my, dissertation partially because I just, I lost all my other jobs. And so I needed to like get this professional credential. And I think a lot about the history of black art in the United States and Amiri Baraka is, and Adrian Kennedy are incredibly important figures. And I really see, you know, that's my, my birthday own, twin. Sorry. What'd you say? That's my birthday twin. We have the same birthday. Really? Me. Yeah. Me and Amiri Baraka. <laughs> oh. And I mean, I, I feel like I'm just, I'm still catching up you know, to, to where he's been. And, and, you know, Fred Moten has been a huge help in that regard, not personally, just through the writing and stuff like that. So I'm really interested in these traditions. I'm really interested in how that tradition continues. Uh, you know, when I was in graduate school as an MFA student, the story of the avant-garde was um, very European and very white. And you just cannot think about the avant-garde worldwide without blackness. I mean, the avant-garde for me really begins with the spirituals that the enslaved black people in the United States began. I mean, it was a creation that broke down the barrier between artists and audience. It was a response to the most horrific labor conditions you can possibly imagine. It was a mixture of high and low. I mean, that, that is it. That is every, I feel like everything I do is a derivative of that thing that they created. And the other thing that really interests me about that. And, and so for me, that's more important than Wagner, more important than the symbolist. I mean, now we're getting into all kinds of academic stuff, but seeing that story and that sweep is just absolutely critically important to me. And it tracks all the way to the present and into the future where people like the artists gathered here are moving it far, far afield of where I can see. But the other thing I, I'd say on that note is, you know, I'm interested in practices that are that are not just about an autonomous work of art, that are about using the work as a way to heal or share as opposed to extract and collect value, you know, I mean, and so Hildegard von Bingen is that for me and this tradition that Baraka emanates from and returns to and Adrian Kennedy and Reza Abdo and, uh, you know, Marlon Riggs, I mean, if we're going in, in other directions and Trajal Harrell and et cetera, et cetera. So I've been really excited because I feel like in the last two years, I've seen more and more work that's not content to just be a work of art and, and people who are more and more committed to not just being an artist and whether in fact it is what, okay. So I'll say something just really basic, really quick is whatever. I mean, right now I work in the nonprofit industrial complex, right? That's how I make a living. Cause I have to make the living. I think most people do. Some people don't good for them, but like, you know, and in that job, I'm doing a little bit of reform every day just to keep the thing from from fucking falling apart. Right. I'm trying to pay people fairly and I'm doing an OK job. And um, but the, but ultimately, there's a horizon in which we need to make an exodus from this thing. We got to get out of the nonprofit industrial complex. And so how how to work at that 
intersection of reform and exodus and the practice of abolition. I mean, that is keeping me up at night and it should, mm -hmm. but in any case, that's what I'm thinking and feeling. Um, I hope I didn't steal too much of the really great energy. Oh, in the no. Room. no, I think, you know, Prelude is an, uh, at least a forum. We try to listen, really listen to new ideas and hopefully also it's a little platform. Um, we, we put you up very at the beginning, you know, but anything you want to add or say to it? Oh, I've said too much. I'm just grateful no. that what... No, no, no. Uh, on, uh, on, not David. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were talking to me. Sorry, I'll mute. Yeah, sorry. <sighs> no, I'm just absorbing, just absorbing. Um... Like, I guess um, this time has really made me question the United States, why I'm here, why I went to this place in the first place. I grew up in Vietnam for like 17 years and I left home and um, I don't know, thinking about war stuff and how it still percolates in my life. Yeah, the pandemic does allow that to happen for me and I yeah, don't want to extract it yet. I don't want to exploit that work for art yet. So it's just trying to keep them separate for now. Um, sorry, I'm going all over the place. <laughs> no, no, that's good. And you said your body was really, in a way, as a sort of movement, if your body was profoundly affected by... Yes, yes. Um, I don't know. I like have thyroid issues. My mom also has thyroid issues. So there's been like that sort of maternal connection that I, yeah, return to. Um, through many ways. It's like my body is forced to return to it. So. I have a question for An because I love you. And oh. <laughs> I, I just want to ask you the question that you ask someone that I feel like will always resonate with me. Do you believe that white, that, that abstraction belongs to white people? And, you know, um, and, 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 you know, as a person who um, lives in a, in a canonization of like shit like Kung Fu Kenny and Nicki Minaj Chung Lee and, you know, like, and, you know, Wu-Tang Clan ain't nothing to fuck with, like, you know what I mean? Like, what do you think about like Asian-ness and Blackness as a, as a marriage of, mm -hmm. of, of abstraction? Mm, that's a heavy question. I don't know. I mean, definitely, I don't think abstraction belongs to white people, but um, I think they invent a certain kind of abstraction and then monopolize on it, for sure. Um, that sort of neutrality, pureness, formalism. Um, and I don't, I feel like war is a pretty abstract thing, don't you think? Like <laughs> trauma, <laughs> things that you inherit. Um, I, and I think I make abstract work and I yeah, look up to... Although, yeah, I'm definitely in the canon of that white abstraction, so I don't know. Can't divorce from that, per se. Um, no, but I guess I'm trying to, I, I, I guess I'm trying to, like, I'm, I'm trying to squeeze out, like, well, like, what do you think about that in the relationships of Asian and Blackness, you know? Like, yes. I mean, I've dated, a, you know, I mean, I was in love with a Cambodian person, and, <laughs> and, you know, and we would talk about that all the time, because I would always feel like, why am I not seen, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, why am I not seen? But also our cultures are, have been, you know, complexly intertwined since the 70s, since yeah. black, since yeah. fucking black exploitation films, yeah. since that mixture of like, you know, since like, since that mixture of what sort of that canon that, un that fortunately, unfortunately, Kung Fu did, like Kung Fu films did, mm -hmm. to then how that reached over to shit like Jet Li and Aaliyah, you know, to how that Like, reached you over. know, like, I remember mm -hmm. studying with, um, oh my God. His last name is Bennett, but he was like one of the founder of the House of Ninja. Um, so he was like friend with Willy Ninja. And he was talking about how Willy Ninja just watched a lot of Kung Fu movies and created these vocabularies that are abstracted from this like white exotic gaze into Asianness. And he created something out of it. Um, and I hope, you know, Chen Li could do that. I hope, like, <laughs> I hope things, I believe in getting things wrong. Uh, I don't believe in getting culture right. I don't believe in authenticity. Um, all the white people get it too wrong, I think. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, right. Um, and I, I mean, think that getting, so too. Yeah, and it's, like, very exploitative. And it's very, like, 
the getting wrong comes also with like exploitation, comes with um, primitivity, like all those things. Like they think of you as inferior. I think there's, I'm dealing with that inferiority very viscerally these days. Um, whereas I feel like in those exchange between Asianness and Blackness, there's something, of course, there's the power is not flat, but I think there's more capaciousness and generosity. Yeah. And you can get things wrong. I don't know. I think that's yeah. what you... A, a question to, to you all. I mean, I heard it was about healing. David talked about um, a kind of a change that we'll have to catch up to things that already didn't happen. I think you all said you know, the personal, the private space and the common space. Do you all feel that this is a time is that a time of change at the moment? Is there, do you feel your work you are showing is some, is there something different? I do. I do, and I don't like what I wanted to say to Anne. The, the, like the last thing was, I filmed my my piece inside of the Asian Arts Initiative here in Philadelphia. It's like a it's a building that's owned by Anne Ishi. If you ever come to Philly, I will introduce you to her. Mm -hmm. uh, she's dope as fuck and she runs the Asian Arts Initiative in Philly and it's like a mini black box and a beautiful gallery and they do stuff for the community and it's right like in like Chinatown but like a little bit out of it so that you can mm -hmm. just sort of be in that world and she's dope and she's really like thinking like we just always have a, these conversations about Asianness and Blackness you know she's from mm -hmm. LA originally so that, you know, is a different, it, like that's always a different thing, but yeah. Um, and to just answer it, yeah, like yes and no. Like I think because, you know, like, because because like the universe is so fucked up and vast, I don't know. I, I don't know if, if like change is, is like happening because for me financially, I need to fucking feel it. Like I need like reparations. I need fucking more fucking money. Like I just need some money, you know what I mean? I'm like, yeah. Like I guess the only way I'm gonna ever feel it is, is is when I can take my mama and my papa somewhere and fucking put them up and like let them feel like they can fucking die gracefully. You know what you I mean? Like, you know, like those are the things that to me really compact change. Right now, it's still the fight. You know, it was just a fucking brutal ass battle. You know, um, and I don't think it's over yet per se. I don't think the change will happen until we start actually really seeing that financially, institutionally, like until it's really in our pockets and, our, and it's in our houses and we're all wearing gold, you know, like, you know what I mean? So it's, 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 it's more like that for me. Yes. Yeah. What do you all think? I mean, you um, just jump in. Well, <laughs> I'm going to piggyback off of that because, um, <laughs> you know, I, you know, growing up was really rough for me, understanding identity, like as a first generation American person um, and being labeled African American and black. And it was just new to me. And um, also like the sensation of it all, I really truly had to like learn who I was. I, I think I just discovered who I truly am like two years like ago or like right right the second, like it's, it's, it's just, it's so important, like, you know, and then going to institutions to study dance and not really be told how to survive with it, but like giving you all this old information that like really doesn't pertain to me. Having a professor literally say out his mouth, like, oh, I can tell by your feet that you had slaves for ancestors and that didn't flinch. <laughs> like, really? The institution that I'm paying for, like, just like things like that. And then really wanted to get out and really. <laughs> And really wanted to share myself and share all my emotions when in fact like nobody cares about me <laughs> like at the end of the day and like um I don't have ownership of my own temple as a, as a mover and so like the pandemic just really helped me realize that um there's more you know all, there's always more work to be done but like specifically how stale everything is like nothing is based off innovation and innovation is kind of like like harvested and saved for certain spaces that aren't back <laughs> you know what i mean and um that if, if one thing i can do to heal myself and heal people that look like me and to give back to people who will resonate with my work with without fear like um is is to create and, and the power of creation you know um and there's not like all the balance that brings in your every day like if you're constantly thinking about these like little pockets of transitions in life you know like 
then you see it in the in the in the real world. You see it in the instinctual world, the animal world, and like we just kind of like we're just operating so far away from that right now, and like the pandemic has just checked our ass so hard, and like some people can can accept that, and some people can't, and the people that can't accept that, they're kind of being left behind because like people really want to move forward. Like everyone's tired of this shit. It doesn't make sense. We need to stop acting like we know what we know when all we know is what we know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we don't know, <clears throat> we only know things we can prove, but like there's so much more to be known and we don't even have the capacity to think that large yet. So that's where I'm at, you know, healing to be open as a channel, as a vessel to like be open to new information. And, um, and we seem to like build information as opposed to just like really realize that it's on us and in us and through us. Mm. Daisy, um, yeah. yeah, God, just wow, so much to absorb here. And I was thinking about, um, yeah, to piggyback on that, our relationship to the unknown, um, and how, yeah, a pandemic can really, can really check us and, and show us that there's so little that we know. And when we become dogmatic and certain about things um that turns really fucking evil really fast you know turns real bad real fast and and i'm since i am you know then coming from this tradition then of like mystics white mystics in this um this very catholic tradition you know and thinking about their relationship to the unknown and why is this relevant today and you know i, I think Hildy was, um, she was very humble about what was coming through her. And she knew that it could be interpreted in a lot of different ways. And, and thinking about also Gregory of Nyssa, who is another mystic, um, somewhat in her, tra her tradition. And he talked about meeting God in this cloud of unknowing. So like literally you can't see anything. You're inside of this cloud. It's like it's blinding white or blinding gray, whatever it is. And um, if there is to be change and positive change from this time, I think it will be through, uh, and, and hopefully it is, and I see it in many artists, like through this very humble relationship with the unknown and willing to transform oneself through that, willing to let go of many, many, many certainties and, um, and to do that in a space of love which I think is what a lot of the mystics said anyway. So that's, thank you all so much for, for like how fantastic this convo is. Thank you. Yeah, I wish people could, could be like that, could have such a capacious relationship to the unknown because I don't know, I don't think anything has changed. It's like, this past few months, it's like people start performing again and everybody goes back to their old habits and just crunch things out, put people in the seats or put people online, produce, produce, produce. I don't know. It's like, why did you not learn any lessons? But I mean, I, yeah, I've been in psychoanalysis these days, so like four times a week in <laughs> therapy. And it's very clear, it's a traumatic Yeah, we, we just lost you in case you can hear us. Um, can you guys hear him? No. I, I, no. no. Wait, hold up. Hold up. Oh, I'm coming back. back. I'm coming back. Yes. My bad. But yes, I was talking through traumatic repetition. Um, so I'm, I'm actually more interested in how we don't change than being obsessed with changing, 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 because I don't think change happens that often. Um, well, well, change really requires everyday action, like yes. literally from yes. the moment you rise out of your, yes. your slumber yes. to like, even in your like daily, you know, and, and, and it's like crazy to like really witness how humans really identify change as something else, when in fact it like really just sits in your own space, you know, like you have to move forward. You you have to like make a choice to, to, to do something different 
for someone else. And <laughs> like, it's just crazy that that concept is um, glorified and also just like, you know, put in a box with a ribbon on it. It's, it's so many things wrong with that. But like, you know, once again, this is why I think it's so important that people know movement, not movement as dance and performance, but movement as like survival to like get you to the next day. You did not cross the street when you were two years old without looking both ways. And people don't know how to do that right now as grown adults, you know what I mean? Um, so just like facilitating change actually requires more than the, the, the idea of action, but the actual idea of doing, like physically moving your organs to do the thing that you said you were gonna do and keep your word in saying that. <laughs> like that's it, you know? Yeah, I just want to add. Um, oh no, go go go, Malcolm, go go go. No, Malcolm, go. Malcolm, yes. Um, I guess uh, like yeah, a lot of things are like resonating with me because it's like um yeah, I guess I've been in this for like um questions since the pandemic of um, I guess just like um, I guess how is the institution showing up for me? And I guess, like, it really, like, the pandemic, like, really proves who, like, all these institutions was pulling, like, the labor from. And, like, even, um, yeah, even in, in these spaces that, like, you know, say we're prone to, um, yeah, I mean, we can't take it to, like, a virtual space, but it's, like, oh, the places that was, like, when it was, like, actually running, the people that was on the front lines was, like, you know, Black and PLC that was like most vulnerable to like COVID-19. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm just thinking of like even after the like pandemic of like people just like losing their, sh I don't want to say like shows, but like losing their crafts and the institutions like not showing up and offering like any compensation or like any relief. And um, luckily, like, it has been, like, quote, unquote, some relief, but it's like, oh, why do I have to go to an application process to apply for, like, you know, <laughs> something I need? Um, but, yeah, I've been, um, I guess I was answering Frank's question about change or... But yeah, everything was, like, resonating. I don't want to be, like, here blabbing and blabbing, but... <laughs> No, what you're saying is, 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 dope. I mean, what I was going to say is so over the pandemic too, and through my process of like, I guess, healing through what I did throughout the pandemic and this relationship and things like that, I, I started reading, um, Sadia Hartman's beautiful, uh, um, Wayward Lies, Beautiful Experiments. Um, and it just was really, was one of the most resonating things here because I was based in Philly um, and am based in Philly essentially everywhere, New York, Connecticut is where I'm from, uh, Maine. So it's, I'm, I, I can be based out there if I wanted to. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's hard because a lot of my um, work sort of lives in the ether of this sexual migration and so much of uh, Wayward Lies was about, I guess, how did black people actually regain intimacy after slavery? Like, what did it look like to be touched, to behold, you know, when your body was literally like not a body? It wasn't, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like, you didn't even understand organs. Like, you don't like, you don't have doctors, you know? And it, 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 it also traced um, the lineage of rape of women and how, you know, a woman could be raped 12 times in a day, you know, you know what I mean? Like in those times. So it was like really, it was, it was, it was really brutal and beautiful because then, because it, it you know, because to be wayward is um, to be, you know, is to be vigilantly, you know, constantly sort of um, pruning, you know, your body, you know, like your body is not even an actual um, uh, organ, like, like vessel it's like we and you know it's like we've we've sort of just now got to understanding what maybe being a vessel for something could be like because all of that shit was a simulation for for like what we're like you know compacting ourselves into right now um and so that's why for me like when i look at um my body you know i'm uh, i'm always trying to think about how liberation is like constantly like happening like 
in order for me to be liberated, I have to uh, resist ever being loved or ever being, you know, sort of like fanticalized by society because, you know, to be liberated is to sort of always be constantly breaking the chain, you know, it's to, it's to constantly be, to be like moving yourself away from the gaze, you know what I mean? And like, that is like, that was, you know, that's, that's just really interesting to me um, while being here and being alive is that like, I understand death and that I, you know, um, just from being a young person, I understood that I had to die and that is a real reality. And, um, and yeah, and so because of, you know, intergenerational legacies and I make a lot of art with people who are in their sixties or in their seventies, um, I, I just look at it very differently too, as well, you know, um, and, 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 and just think about that relationship of uh, cultural competency, connectivity, but also from a sexual lens, which, yeah, that's just my frame. Mm. David. Um... Um, I don't know how much I have to add. I mean, I think what I'm, what I've been inspired by has been the, the efforts and ongoing efforts to organize and to share and the ways in which, well, I'll give you an example as Frank, you know, uh, she had him on Siegel talks, you know, Chris Myers and a group of other, the actor, uh, based in New York and a group of other comrades that formed, uh, a working group, ongoing working group called anti-capitalism for artists. And I think that's just incredible that that people are not, you know, siloing race, gender, sexuality, class, but the the level of critique and analysis and organizing around shared structures that are slowly killing people has been just night and night and day in a lot of ways, at least in a certain kind of public sphere. So that's been really inspiring, but Man, it's hard for me not to also see, as everyone else already mentioned, like the really devastating continuities. And I think what's really hard, I mean, Malcolm, you talked about like applying for relief, right? What's really hard is like, it's really easy. Okay, so I'm on the other side now, the nonprofit industrial complex, because I run this small theater in Maine that, you know, trying to keep working. And on the one hand, it's like, yeah, it's good that we, offer relief, but the condition of possibility for that is that it makes you an individual, right? The institution individuates people when otherwise this wealth should be shared and not, oh, well, are you good enough to get this? Do you know what I mean? And and it's the same thing for, it, it also applies to the, to the same thing about the police, right? The police are here to separate us from our social wealth. The condition of possibility for carceralism is the individuation of what otherwise should be an ongoing shared social life. Okay, so why am I saying all this? Because, you know, defund the police, absolutely. Cops off campus, absolutely, as someone who's taught in a university. But the majority of policing that happens on a college campus happens in the classroom by faculty. And the same thing is true of the nonprofit theater. The majority of the policing that happens in the nonprofit theater happens by administrators, especially including me. And that's the thing that like, I have to be vigilant about speaking for myself. And I think that's so hard for the institution to change because the structures in which these things have got up from which capital is hoarded and extracted and which people see things. I mean, it's really difficult to I, I And I don't wanna say, I don't want to complain here about oh, it's really hard for people who are nonprofit ministers. Not the hard thing, as Arian said, is is wanting your parents to die with dignity. That's fucking hard. Right. How to fundraise from the Ford Foundation is nothing compared to that challenge. But, you know, at the same time, as part of my job, I'm just figuring out how to, like, triangulate those two things, how to get it, how to whatever levers I got to pull. How can I get a little bit closer to that? So the people around me that I share space with that create for me and show up that their parents and their family can stop dying a little bit less. So that was mm -hmm. a rant, but, um, that's, that's you true. know, just a, yeah. A question to all of it. What could, what would really help or what are examples? What really, uh, what could make a difference or what, what do you guys need or what does our society need or our city of New York, you know, where people go back to performance, what do we need? Meaning what you fucking say, following up with what you, ah, uh, it's just like, 
all you have to do is follow through to care about someone else and then do it. That's it. <laughs> like, like no facades, no portfolios, no applications. If you if you really say you care about this thing, then care about it. It's it's just it's just that different. I mean, I mean, just that simple. Like whatever insecurities you have about you, you cannot project that into a situation when it's about others. That's it. Fix your shit. It's your responsibility. And you can't hide behind money. You can't behind, hide behind clothes. You can't buy, hide behind art. You can't hide behind... Just deal with it in the space. And then when somebody's in the space who knows how to deal with it, don't treat them like they're fucking crazy. Because like you watch all these people on the street. My, you know, my grandfather was homeless here in New York City. And he knew five languages and he used to be rich, but he was generous and he gave so much until he was empty and he literally died empty. And like, just mean what you say. If, you, if, if, if everyone was doing the same thing, it would be a chain reaction. And, and I still haven't seen any perfect example of that yet. And everything I've ever known in my existence and my life as being an, an American citizen has all been lies, everything. Everything has been a lie. So I'm just waiting for some truth. And if I'm sitting here trying to figure out truth, I just, I, I demand truth. And that's it. Like, like, I, like, I'm not going to sit here and be gaslit anymore, you know? Yeah, um, pe people are not great at telling the truth. Like, it's not actually a, a skill that's taught and it's not actually something that goes over so well in the company of others in, in any way. Like telling the truth is kind of dangerous business. And you know, I was just thinking about, you know, this this business model of like, you know, under promise and over deliver, which is like kind of a nice way to go about in your in your life. And I was thinking also about what what on said about um, seeing a lot of art institutions, establishments, uh, clubs, places like going back up now, kind of like the way it was before and feel and seeing that, like seeing that on social media and, and being, I question myself. I'm like, is it just because I'm shy or I'm like jealous of it or is it FOMO or being a little bit disturbed by that, being like, I can't just go and start back up in, in full swing. I'm, I'm not there. I'm not there with it. Um, so, so yeah, t the truth. And I think what we're supposed to be doing with, with art is telling the truth in some way. And that can look like so many, so many different things. And, you know, to, to quote, you know, what's, what's been said in here too, this idea of like, just moving, just m moving is a way of telling the truth. Actually, it's not talking, it's not thinking, it's not promising, it's just moving. And for me, I'm getting goosebumps saying this. For me, that's like, just open your mouth and fucking sing. Bring somebody else into it, it's just singing. If I sing, I'm thank going you. to- the, Thank you. I mean, if I sing, I'm going to change the energy of my physical body and Us. myself around me, Us. right? Same Ooh. thing. So it's just, we have to do the thing. Just do the thing, do the thing, do the thing, do the thing. That is telling the truth, right? In some way. We have to check that too, always, but but it's just moving. Sorry, I really loved that. Thank you. <laughs> well, I was I was piggybacking off of you, so so thank you. Bless. <laughs> Malcolm, do you uh, what what do you feel? What is needed? Um, I guess, like, I feel that there's no one answer to that question, obviously. But I think, like, institutions can, like, you know, start things like reparation funds. And just, like, even, like, say, yeah, the artists that they do support have access to a reparations fund. Because um, I'm thinking of um, how, like, um, well, me specifically, like being like this downtown experimental dancer, or whatever, like how a lot of these like places were built off for like slave labor and like, you know, these like churches having like slave galleries and being like a part of these spaces. And like, I guess like knowing that and being aware and being conscious of if I enter this space, it can conjure up anything inside of me and my body. Um, 
I think the money was also um, resonating with me because I'm also from New York and it's like, um, yeah, just being in New York and always being in a space of I have to produce something, I have to be doing, I have to be this machine. Um, but the radical act being like, oh, giving myself permission to rest or even thinking of like, yeah, I don't have this like access to capital that I can possibly be homeless like in a given moment and like, you know, die with nothing to my name. Um, so yeah, I'm thinking of all these things, but I feel like, the, I mean, yeah, there's no one answer, but I feel like, like, yeah, if you are in a space to give resources of considering like, you know, what does a reparation fund look like, especially for black artists and um, if it's like, you know, if you produce a show and, you know, yeah, I don't know. It's it's all, it's not tricky, but I guess like one step forward is in a better direction than, um, yeah, this constant cycle of like white supremacy and patriarchy just like killing us. Yeah, I'm like in thinking about reparation, I'm like, I've been thinking a lot about how really amazed that this one word that we grew up in Vietnam, and not just the word, like the spirit of sacrifice. Um, like that's how we won the war, you know, like we sacrificed. Whereas here, people give up like philanthropic generosity that's their relationship to the other uh, like here's something take it like there's no sense of cultural sacrifice and not just the us i really think the west with this individuation um and it's just so brutal and i i know i wish my work could somehow access these rich people and, and like give them a sacrificial ritual and like <laughs> make them give up something um but i don't know i don't know how to do that um, otherwise these people are just gonna hoard just hoard 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 and they give when they want and they give out a fraction of what they have yeah i feel the same um i i feel like what what we need is access resources sustainability foundation, access, the ability to have shelter, transportation, food, water, sleep, toilet paper, you know, resources. All the rich white people that you know that fund the JFK Center and Asalakalika and all of the things that they be funding all around the world, resources, you know what I mean? You know? Sustainability, the ability to let my parents die with dignity and that my aunties and my uncles and the grandchildren and the nieces and nephews after me can have a life better than me. Sustainability, foundation, the ability to build, but not just to build institutionally, but financially, spiritually, leisurely, to have rest as as a root of foundation, to have love as a root of foundation, you know? But <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> That's a, you know, um, and then, I, you know, yeah, you know, and then as an artist, you know, we'll just, you know, we'll just take it, you know, we'll just take it to the next level. You know what I mean? I think as artists, we just are meant to take shit to the direct source of the human that needs to feel it. You know, it's like, oh, you don't really understand this really brutalized, you know, idea. Like you don't understand um, the poetics of health. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like, you know, so it's like, uh, I gotta, uh, I gotta bring you directly to it, you know? Um, and um, that's the beauty, I guess, of, that and I'm I just also want to say thank y'all too because this this festival has you know its little history. I know Marina has also been a part of this festival. Yeah. yeah, you know, so it's like it's interesting that we are like connected in this narrow lineage of people like Marina, you know what I mean? And 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 now we're here, you know, doing something that's that that 
that isn't about going beyond it. It's just about the trend. Uh, it's about the how how it transcended. You know, what I mean, itself to you know to where it is. Uh, to me personally, yeah. Malcolm, I think you had your head hand up. If I saw that right, I was scratching the back of my neck with no <laughs> needle and thread. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so then my question, I'll say something. Go say No, go, go. No, 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 Malcolm, come on. Yeah, go, 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 Malcolm, go. No, no, I'll come back around, go. No. <laughs> no, so then I guess I I guess like I guess I have a question for you, Martin. Like, how do you how do you want to see the world um change drastically? But also someone like I guess I'm speaking from an intergenerational standpoint like how do you feel about witnessing a lot of the world change um time and time again and the brutalisticness of it but also like did you even really see it when did you see it when did you decide to see it if you saw it you know what i mean Wait, who was that question for? Sorry. It was for Frank. Oh, sorry, Frank. Yeah, you said Martin. <laughs> Martin. Sorry, I said Martin. I'm sorry. I was thinking about Martin Segar. I figured, but like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Javadi. The Thank spirit you. is here. Spirit. <laughs> I was like, Martin. His name is Martin. <laughs> to me. It's a, it's a good question. I mean, I was in Berlin when the wall came down that day when it happened. Uh, okay. When it was announced, I saw that. I was here when, you know, the uh, Twin Towers, when they fell down, I saw that. Um, and um, and I saw think also prelude, uh, prelude uh, a Corona, um, you know, is something which is a fundamental change that has happened. It has already happened, I think. We might not be aware of it. And um, and we we are, we are worried, you know, if you look, the bigs might get bigger and the smaller places get smaller at the moment, that um, actually that what that change should bring, as um, um, David pointed out, and Anne and Daisy, you know, that um, it should actually be a time to learn something. What have all these people died for? Um, you know, um, if, if if not to learn from it, what his life is about, and um, and so I um, I do think that something fundamental at the moment is happening. I think you guys, our artists, are you know uh, anticipating the future. You put your finger on something. We barely live in the present as normal people, but artists often anticipate what is coming, and it's a uh, it's a bit gruesome uh, a lot what we what we see, what we hear, what we feel, and I think the. Uh, ideas of movement through body and to of healing of Daisy of people singing singing songs moving to music, I think to bring people together uh, in circles, but not as feeding the machine. I think you all talked about that. You know that there's a big machine and the machine is hungry, but you're part of it and you also work for it. But to say no, we should not feed the machine. We should actually sabotage it. Sabu was the idea for like wooden shoes. I think that's the name. People threw it, French workers, in the machines and they stopped. And um, and I think we have to understand that perhaps theater is you know, uh, fighting against the idea of what a commercial theater really is and not try to get into it. And I do hope um, that there will be something, that there is something at the moment that is changing. We closed basically our center. I really don't know what we're going to do in the upcoming year, I feel we maybe have to reach out and to work in the parks or create a citywide festival. We're going to talk about it. But I feel strongly, and we all feel strongly, something visible have to change. If we don't change, who else will? Who, who If artists are not part of it, who else will? It can't be that the Michael Jackson uh, musical coming back up again is a sign that, you know, all is good. So um, I'm yeah. So I don't know. I wish um, I had good answer, but I feel we are uh, in, in in profound in a time moment of profound change, and that's why I think the idea of the twelve curators or thirteen, create you know inviting all these others that perhaps we can give some answers. We might not be able to detect it right away, but you guys and to he listen to you and uh, and to um, really um, being open and listening to what you say. I think this is uh, important and it's a first step. It's a small step. We are tiny also in the, like a homeopathic pill in the big body of American theater or America in itself. But I feel um, 
we do something here that is different. We changed um, it through our structure, and it's a, a little sign for it. Is it good enough? Um, I do not know, but um, for me, part of change is to really listen to what you all say. We need some money, and I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. We got paid. Yeah, we did. I mean, we we we, we are a very small organization that's barely surviving, but we pay. You know, I think a, a relatively good amount. And we also, with the award, we're going to give out uh, to Shade from the National Black Theater. We give a real support. So we really are trying. It's a very very large amount, um, and we don't even have a theater of our own. But we had a university, so it's easier. But the uh, uh, public universities are terribly underfunded. You know, David will know if you go to, you know, I think Harvard University has $56 billion in endowment. I don't know if CUNY has 10 million, that must be a lot of 20, um, for 20 colleges. And um, there is a real um, imbalance um, here. And they still asked for a long time, full tuition for people to study acting, to create art. It's shocking. And I think universities also have to change as David, um, a David did say. But um, I would like to know what inspired you in the time now of the corona? What got you through that? Or what, uh, you know, made you change your thinking? Did anything change? Did it confirm? Or was there something what you saw, what you did, what you read, what you listened to, what you moved to, or what you created that um, was meaningful? Um, so the world stopped and the, the uncertainty uh first but then still like you know waking up that day to those videos of you know george floyd and that sandra park woman and like <laughs> just being like just can't get a break <laughs> you know like really just like because you know before you would say these stories and they're just like kind of flushed out all the time and no one listens to you um you know like you experience these things with people you know. I'm, I'm I'm actually experiencing something right now with people who like don't really realize they're inherently racist and that, you know, be saying that you're a black owned restaurant with no black people working there and then for there's only to be one is is problematic. <laughs> you know, just like things like that. Small pocket of spaces. Anyway, waking up that day <laughs> and just like being truly disrespected, just like feeling that everything I fought for means nothing, as it doesn't. It doesn't mean anything, you know? Like, we, we own nothing. We only own the time that we, we are gifted being here. We, we have no understanding of our consciousness and what that means. And we don't even know how to relate to each other. So um, that really is what pushed me to do what I've been doing. And, like, this project was actually came right before the pandemic. And I was like, how fitting was this when I was like questioning who are you really when shit hits the fan? I don't want to know who you are when you want to grab drinks or grab dinner. We want to hee hee ha ha all the time, kiki. Ki. Like, who are you really? Like, if, if, if the world was sinking into a hole and there was a fence, are you going to help me over the fence? Are you going to teach me how to climb the fence? Like, like, let me know who you really are when it's a moment of life or death. Because, you know, we have all this time to think about it in this, like, safe space of America where we are on top of the world, all that shit. But I'm like, I can't think about the amount of people that haven't had time to, to save their own selves from someone else's shit. You know, like, bombs are being dropped on their head. You know, like, kids are fucking, like, literally bone thin. I, I like, watch a video of, like, a, a kid that was so hungry that they were eating their own nails. And then we and we have all this food here. I mean, it's just, it's just too much. Um, that's what woke me up that day. And I was like, this is something I already knew, but like, just wow, how disrespectful for it to still be a thing. And like, I have to sit here and watch that for 10 minutes. And that could have been me. And as someone that grew up in a police system, like, um, I was a 71st precinct explorer, which meant like I was basically training to become a cop um, at a certain point, but I did all the drills and the camping and all of that stuff. And I'm, and those cops were lovely. To have that mindset, to then go, oh, I'm college and I'm polished, to then go me being beat down by five, six, five men, white men, and then, and then being made fun of, like as I'm bleeding, 
and they're literally making fun of me. And the one black person in the precinct was a black woman and she couldn't even look me in my face. And I was like, oh, oh, this is what justice is. I'm literally limping because my IT band is shot because that punched me so hard. And when they're like, why are you limping? My IT band is shot. What's an IT band? I'm like, oh, so you touching bodies out here? You don't even know anatomy. And I had to fucking, <laughs> you know what I mean? This is what got me up. And it's gonna keep me up because I, I I have zero tolerance. Um, it's irresponsible. I don't care what you look like or who you are. You know, like there is motion for humanity to do better. Just do better. Just be better. Just seek, be more curious. Uh, seek more inquisition. Like have more conversations. You know, like if you're scared of it, admit that you're scared of it. <laughs> like that, I don't know what's so hard about that. And if it's the emotion and the sensation, then you need to move your body. You need to sing a song. You need to write something down. I don't know what to tell you, you know? Yeah. And, awesome. and also when you see Second Skin Imposter, you're going to feel that shift because it's beautiful. And not just that, it's beautiful. It's like, it's weird when you have an artist who feels so interconnected to very radicalistic shit, but then can transform it into a wave that's like, completely um, refined and distilled and direct and just the modalities within the movement and the ways in which the dancers are, are like in the frame and the ways in which they shape the frame and the body and the way that Damani literally choreographs these fucking human beings that are just like elegant, you know, strings of time into these very um, uh, um, like, like neutralistic toned, um, uh, like weird shape people, you know, like to avoid you attaching um, any other personality besides the personality or the mentality that the body wants you to be within, you know? That's just hard and that's just beautiful. And that's why I'm like, when you watch it, Sackett's Kid Imposter, at the prelude NYC, you're gonna see that that shit is dope. Like it's incredible, and the angles and the camera, it's rich as fuck. It's cinematic as fuck. It's luxurious. It's sun. You know what I mean? And Which, I, yeah, I have know? to just imply, yeah. like it looks that way, but I'm really good at making something from nothing. That's all I'll say. <laughs> so, so, so yeah. I mean, I very Malcolm, happy. You, sorry, Malcolm. Did you what you're saying? Something hey, you keep on. <laughs> I saw the. Malcolm, uh, what did you say? <laughs> or Daisy? Yeah. Um, I can say something. Um, <laughs> um yeah, I, I guess I, I, while Ariad and Demi was talking, I kept on having flashbacks of like Emia, but in a good way of just being like, I guess I was of that coming of age of like. I kind of don't remember anything or like, but I remember like these two individuals as like, um, I guess for these like experiences in the camp that like shifted me, like I, I feel like I wouldn't remember like a lot of any of the other people, <laughs> but I guess it was like, I guess it was in conversation into, I guess just um, their ability to be present but also, I guess, like, within, like, this, not camp, but within, like, these, like, set of movements of, like, how they kind of, like, surpass that or, like, yeah, just, like, the shapes was just, like, very, like, particular and, like, different that, like, stood out. Um, I hope I'm making sense, but... <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's, it's complex, as as, just, say, as many say. But what do you... You I are created pieces. I guess just to see it develop into, like, what it is now. Again, it just has this, like... Yeah, this futuristic, like... Yeah, not in this normal sphere, but, yeah, you know... Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I love you all, both. <laughs> a little bit closer to the end of the second but uh, session, but my question is, you all created work, actually, and people put you out. Curators said what these artists have to say is meaningful. 
with what you created now, what we see in excerpt, it's a work in progress. Of course, the real piece will come later. But what is your hope? What do you feel? What contribution can or should it make? Uh, I don't think there's an answer to that. Um, I think we all make art for different reasons. I think the overall umbrella concept of art making and art providing is to affect. Um, now, we don't have any control of like how it's going to affect because people will receive it as they receive it. But, um, you know, there's something about like, there's a reason why artists are poor. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, we see life in the way that like we think about possibility um, and, you know, hoping that you know, we change someone else's lives to get out this mundane thing that you think you have to do for the sake of capitalism. And capitalism isn't survival, you know? Like, we don't need it, but like, here we are participating in it. And um, just to be free from that, to, to, to imagine worlds, to, to, um, to broaden the sense of imagination for the greater humanity, like on the back end, where it's like this sort of energetic thing and this kind of hopeful thing, um, I don't, yeah, I don't think there's an answer to that. Like, you know, like, it's just like the, the hope that it will make sense and that like culture, if, 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 if it is perceived as culture, that it will be respected and cared for, soaked in and shared, and then also self-experience. Like, I want you to tr go do something too, you know, like, it's not about me telling you how I'm seeing the world. It's like, no, I'm, this is how I see the world through all of our eyes, you know? So, Ann, you want to say something? Let me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I just want to bring back some sense of religion, not even like spiritual movement, um, devotion. Um, which is hard through video, so, but I think the theater is a little more conducive to that, to be honest, surprisingly. Yeah, and as I said, I would love to facilitate a sacrificial ritual. So if you know anybody who is a good fit, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> I, think um, really I also wanted to, uh, I didn't want to get too heavy into that conversation, but you know, I have a, a specific relationship with Asian culture that I'm so disconnected from, but so connected to, because my grandfather was from Macau. Um, and I, you know, he died before I can ever even learn about that past. And when I lived in Shanghai for a month and a half, I felt more at home there than I did here in America. And when I came back to America, I was kind of like, wow, that's so crazy that I was conditioned to think that China was dirty, China, you know, like, you know, like, you know, just like all these things and, and, and communism and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I stayed in this whole ass, very, very humble motel. And it was literally next to a slum. And those people walked out with dignity and, 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 and clarity, like, like looking better than me in suits, even though it was a slum right there. You know what I mean? And... And I was just like, oh, like we, we are about the, the, the thing that Daisy said, uh, I forgot, like overproducing under, under all of that. And, and I was like, <laughs> and, like, you know, but I'm like, but I felt so at home there. And like mm -hmm. the racism that I, if it was, I don't even know if I could call it racism because like the racism there is definitely nothing compared to anything I've experienced here. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I, it's, it's inquisition. They're like, they don't have many black people. They have questions. They don't know how to ask the questions because, you know, imperialism, communism, blah, 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 stay in your lane, blah, blah, blah. Whatever, it just, it just makes sense. Whereas here it's like, it's actually hate, <laughs> you know? Um, anyway, I just wanted to share that with you because it's like something I, like that's going to be a life. Um, and maybe Daisy, we're going to hear you tonight, right? At seven o'clock, you will be one of the yes. performances. Yeah, each day, 
we at seven o'clock we have one live element. It's online, but it's live. You can actually see, I think, all 13, 14 presentations right away on the web. You can look at it. But Daisy, what what's what's your hope? When we when we click on tonight and we listen to you, what what do you what do you imagine for, for your audience? <laughs> Mm, well, um, well, I'm just really into is ecstatic states and I want to take you with me. I just want you to come. Um, I, I don't know if you will or not. I, I don't know. I don't know what will happen, but I mean, I think, um, yeah, uh, ritual, the word ritual has been mentioned, but, um, I think, sacred music is really important not just as a as somebody who um it's important for sacred music to feel like it belongs to a lot of people like or everybody it's not just like this performative thing and i feel like you know what i do with hildegard sort of has two prongs i do perform it but i also do bring people into it all the time i want people to sing with me it's not complete for me unless um other consciousnesses other people are brought into it maybe hildy will show up i don't know sometimes she does sometimes she's like hey what's up i'm i'm here and um so yeah ecstatic states i and it was funny i was thinking about this answer and then i was like god is that frivolous is that a frivolous answer and i was like no no mm -hmm. it's not there's pleasure in that there there is an element of the unknown in that there is hu there can be hopefully humility in that there are questions about it there's a transform uh, transformation or possibly a transformative experience and that's really oh my god that's really saying a lot about um <laughs> tonight i just want to have a really great conversation with david tonight and sing a little bit those are those are the things that i would like to happen but um overall that's that's kind of what this uh project is about for me um yeah and the, the i love how it became like over generate it's under promise and over deliver yeah it's in yeah. a corporate speak but but yeah it's like so uh it's so deep i think about yeah. it all the time and the money said you know what's really happening people you know, under promise, uh, over the no, over promise and under deliver, right? Exactly. She said exactly the opposite. That's what's happening. We have about five more minutes, Malcolm and David um, or Aaron. Something you still, you know, I mean, you 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 create work. It's, you know, that's why we feel Prelude is a celebration of the art. It's so hard to make art anywhere in the world, but in New York, it is it is especially, and for you guys especially with everything what we heard about. You know, so well, so what's yeah, I mean, for me, I know this. I have a live show. I'm about to do plugs because it's like 122. So I'm plugging. I just want to say shout out Domson from Mars. Shout out Hilton Palmer. Shout out Kevin Hernandez Rosa. Shout out Nicholas Sarambana. Shout out Marisa Williamson. Shout out Noah Michael Smith. Shout out Hano Hano, who did some music out of uh, Mexico, shout out Klein, who's this really dope sound artist in London. Shout out Damani, shout out Malcolm. Um, come see me perform in Philly in December, um, December 17th, 18th, and 19th. The show is called Equators. It'll be at Icebox Project Space. It's about blackness and climate change and natural disasters. It's been a project that I've been doing since 2018. Um, so, yeah, you know, like that's my whole thing. Like, I might just just like come through and just try to see as much radical shit that you can fucking see and mm -hmm. you know and like I want to come out and see everyone's shit as much as I possibly can. But that's just what I needed to say last minute and just to plug it. And everyone, shout out, you know, Prelude Festival and watch Quinquennial because it's dope. It's fucking weird as fuck. You know what I mean? Quinquennial is that shit. So yeah, cool. Um, I'll just say, as a Prelude alum, I'm really excited by this chain curing experiment. I think there's no other possibility in which this ecstatic, uh, pissed off, fabulous configuration of artists would have come together. So that's really great. I've never been to Philly. So December sounds like a great time to go there. And um, I'll just say really briefly, you know, the two things I'm really working on or that, that I'm trying to, to move through and with or in my own, you know, the theater that I'm responsible for are fair labor conditions. That's my main priority for the next 12 months. I just started the job 
a couple weeks ago. Um, so finding every lever I can pull to get more money into the hands of artists um, and to um, have those artists bring their work and share their work with people who, who want to show up uh, for each other the most. That's the most urgent thing in the register of reform that I'm working on. And then the larger long-term ongoing always project is to how to defend the chorus that Saidia Hartman talks about in Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments. And, you know, it might, it might be because I'm, because, you know, I've, I've been thrown into the historical social position of whiteness that I can't be a part of it, but I can help defend and I can show up. Um, even though if it, even, even though, again, it, it may not, I may not be able to be included at this historical juncture, but that book, you know, I just had to say it was really inspired me. And if anybody what hasn't the book? it out, uh, it's called Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments by Sigia Hartman. Probably one of the most important thinkers just thinking now, forever. I don't know, you know, but it's, it's a really extraordinary book about black women in New York and Philadelphia um, during the turn of the 20th century and how they survived these really brutal conditions and how they found intimacy and love and expression, all these things that Darian was talking about earlier. So yeah. It's, yeah. it's really great. Yeah, it's like the book that I use when I sort of been making my latest work. And when you come to Philly in December, I can bring you to where she was talking about 700 Lombard Street. Oh, where, yes. Where W.E.D. voice lives. They have they have his little thing where he lived, you know, and where he wrote the Philadelphia New Negro, which is a part of, you know, City of Hartman's finding, you know, within that whole mm. thing. But yeah. It's yeah. Cool. Du Bois but, is a really interesting character in that whole saga. Very funny, yes. And now again, since we are so close to Malcolm, <laughs> we didn't scratch your back this time, but say something. Um, and we're getting close uh, um, to it, you know, and uh, you did both, you know, you're participating in Curate. So tell us, uh, you know, what, what's your, if there is something hopeful or something where you say this is why you do this? Yeah, yeah. Um... I normally make my own work. I was like um, picked by Nal Harris and like we've been working like closely together. Um, and he curated on, um, yeah, I guess the, like this curation seems like, I guess like a giving back or like an offering to like, you know, my community. And I feel like, I guess that's what the chain curation like has created, and I think David said it, I guess this, um, we wouldn't be in the same room if it wasn't having like these like, um, I guess like meaningful dialogue, um, yeah, between like the works and the conversations. Um, yeah, I feel like there's a sh obviously a shift that happened since the pandemic, but I feel like, um, with these, um, it gives us a space of possibility to um, show up where we are, as opposed to like um, having to show up to the institution <laughs> that I can be in my home. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm hopeful about that or interested to see how like mm -hmm. Purdue like um, continues that. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think that's a great thing to say. What we are doing, you know, what it is a meaningful dialogue hopefully, and a meaningful conversation. That's a big thing, and that's important, and meaningful listening, I think I would add. So really, thank you all, and we could go on much more. Each one of you could have been, I think, you know, a full session and to go uh, deeper, but um, uh, we will go on, and this is just an idea for an idea and to inspire. We will have the 12 noon uh, panels going on through the week. Um, tonight at uh, 4.30, uh, Helen Shaw, the great Helen Shaw, also was a theater critic who was a brilliant theater one. She put together a panel with young critics, new collective that come together that also say we have to look differently and we have to write differently about theater. So it will be interesting. They just formed um, what they say and what change might mean to, mean to them. And then, of course, tonight at 7.00. Daisy, so uh, we all we all can't wait, and it would be great if Hildegard shows up, and she is there, and she is with you, and she's a, a quite a mystique and a, quite an important thinker. And as everybody pointed out, there were moments in time, turn of the century or others. You know, now is such a time of of movement and change. We and we have to be in it, and we also have to be the change we want to see. So, and I hope um, that. Um, um, and you also feel a bit inspired, you know, and, uh, and through our Prelude Festival, it's really is a celebration of the work. And to say this is what you guys do is important. 
this is a meaningful and significant contribution to the life of the city. And it's not commercial and it's not out there to advance a, a career as what you do is real. It's significant what is artists struggling and sharing their experiences. So thank you all. Thanks again for the uh, Siegel team. And um, I will see you hopefully some of you tomorrow, but please all uh, check that uh, uh, Prelude Festival. So many, so much work went into it from all the curators. So I hope there's something that is meaningful um, to all of you. Thank you all. And um, thank you to our listeners. I know how much is out there at the moment. When we started our Siegel Talks last March, there are very few conversations. Most people should repeat. Now there are so many conversations online and now we feel now we have to show work again so um so it's a great uh, um, um a great privilege for us to, to to host this really thank you all i'm i'm very thankful and um onwards goodbye bye bye thank you thanks for you guys to take time <clears throat>